welcome to Saturday Morning Trek, just one of many podcasts on Trek FM. If you'd like to help keep Star Trek discussion coming your way each day, consider becoming a network patron through Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm and find out how you can become part of the team. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm. This is Walter Koenig, Chekhov from Star Trek, and you're listening to Trek FM. Their mission to fight injustice, to right that which is wrong, and to boldly go where no man has gone before. Welcome to Saturday Morning Trek. Join us at Trek FM as we hearken back to the days of wood panel dens, console televisions, and astronaut Farrah Fawcett. I'm Aaron Harvey, co-host of Saturday Morning Trek, and today we're honored to be talking with none other than Dorothy D.C. Fontana, story editor and associate producer of Star Trek The Animated Series. A television writer since the early 1960s, Dorothy was the personal assistant to Gene Roddenberry and became a prominent creative force behind Star Trek. She had a large part in developing the character of Spock and his family in her story Journey to Babel. She continued her Star Trek ties when she signed on to the animated series in the 1970s, and further deepened Spock's backstory in her script, Yesteryear. Dorothy had the distinction of being one of the few people to have worked on the original series, the animated series, The Next Generation, and Deep Space Nine. But Star Trek certainly wasn't the only thing she worked on in the 1970s. She brought a strong female voice to other shows like The Six Million Dollar Man, Land of the Lost, and Logan's Run. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dorothy Fontana to the Trek FM wood panel den. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> We're here today to talk about your involvement with the animated series. If you could tell us a little bit, how did you get involved with that? Well, in early 1973, uh, Gene Roddenberry called me and said, uh, let's have dinner. So I went to dinner with him and, and his wife. And um, he was saying, you know, we could do this uh, animated series of Star Trek. Um Filmation is interested, and NBC is interested, so would you like to be involved? And I said, yeah, that sounds like fun. Uh, work was a little slow at that time. I was writing, but uh, still, like, this, yeah, be involved with Star Trek again, that was wonderful. And even an animated series offered opportunities that um, storytelling we weren't able to do on the original uh, Star Trek series. One of the things that we had read that Gene was excited about the medium of animation because it allowed him to do things like have a volcano, something that you couldn't have on the original series in live action. Uh, Yes, you could do a lot of things with animation that were not possible, obviously, on the live show. For instance, we could have any kind of creature we wanted to and didn't have to worry about a zipper might show uh, or things like that. And if the creature needed to fly, no problems, or uh, morph into something else, no problem. We could also have wonderful planet sets that we didn't have to build on a stage. So uh, there were opportunities, obviously, in the animation creation that we could not have done on the original series. And that opened a lot of uh, story possibilities for us. And some of those backgrounds ended up being, even being recycled into some of future filmation shows. I think that some of them were on He-Man, from what I understood. Possibly. I'm not sure of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, I always thought that they were really kind of some amazing architecture. And I, I always joke that uh, Spock's guest room in yesteryear, the family, it's like, I want the bed and the lamp. It's yes. just this, this mid-century modern space sort of look to it. It's fantastic. Yes. But before we get into those details... Um, I want to ask, what was the reception by the fans? I know it was uh, debuted at a convention, or at least the concept of it was. Uh, A lot of people were doubtful at first when this was announced. And we began production basically, if I remember correctly, in about April. Um, So we had show it shows in work that mm-hmm. had been written and had been voiced and were in creation in terms of animation on you know that was going on but we didn't have much to show and i went to the world con that year which i believe i remember was in toronto Cal- uh, canada and uh i had to present something uh that was the new star trek animated series right after robert block did a master of ceremonies opening you know <laughs> <laughs> And I said, oh, my God, I'm doomed, because all I really had was 
the opening title sequence. But I announced it, and when it came on screen, here it was. It was the opening of the show. We parried it. We, we paralleled it absolutely correctly with the music, with the voices. And when it came in, it was like, oh, my God, they really are going to do it right. And we got an enormous, wonderful applause, cheering, etc., just on about a minute and a half of film. That was all we had to show people at the time. It was just the opening title sequence. That was it. But they did see that all the key voices were there. William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, Dorforest Kelly, etc. And, oh, yeah, that went over very well. So when we went on the air, ultimately, I think it was late September, um, we did have a good audience there. And even an audience that wasn't the usual Saturday morning audience that was for an animated series. Yeah, I one of the things that I heard David Gerald mention that he said, you know, they really were trying to also make sure that people who were just rolling out of bed or or were oh, what's on TV, you know, and and just so you're capturing that other audience as yes. well. And of course, among the Star Trek fans, there was an enormous network. Uh, obviously, not on the internet, not then, but an enormous uh, mail phone wonderful communication between all those fans who said we got to watch this and they did uh at that time of course you were still reliant on nielsen ratings and those kinds of things where not everybody had that little machine on your television set to show what you were really watching but it was getting a great reception and again we were getting a tremendous amount of fan mail which was always an indicator i remember hearing that there was a lot of um, fan clubs and, and women-generated fandom, which I think is interesting because now yes. that's becoming, you know, the, the new thing. It's like, oh, you know, women are actually geeks as well. And it's like, but that's been happening since 1968, 60, Absolutely. 65. Some, absolutely. Some of our biggest fans were various women who were behind fan clubs or behind fanzines or behind, uh, you know, uh, fanfic, you know, fan fiction. Yes. Uh, <laughs> And so we did have a lot of women followers. We also had a lot of men. Yes. But they were perhaps not quite as vocal as the women tended to be, which was wonderful because we always love to hear from people. And as long as that fan mail was rolling in, there was a really nice reaction from NBC saying, oh, we are reaching fans. We are getting out to those people who used to like the original show. And, oh, my God, we've got an audience. So, uh, you know, that was useful at the time. Today, they would have been inundated with email and, and all kinds of stuff, Facebook and all these other things that people used to communicate. But then we had to rely on snail mail and <laughs> phone calls, really. <laughs> but it worked. It worked. Yeah. And at that point, then the original series was also becoming really popular in Absolutely. syndication as well. So Absolutely. I'm. It, this is one of the things that I think is interesting that people kind of gloss over when they look at the animated series, that it is one of those things that kept Star Trek going through the 70s and into the point that there was a movie that then became more movies and then another television show. You know, it was that bridge between in that decade. I would agree. Uh, although we only had basically 22 episodes, a season and a half, technically, but two seasons if you count it the way they did then. Right. Um, still, it was very popular. And uh, it did pull audience, and that was what NBC wanted. But then when they got to the end of the 22, I'm not sure how they felt about it, uh, whether they felt it was a little too expensive or not. I never was able to probe the NBC mind to know, but uh, we did do a very good animated series, I believe. I think one of the the issues that that came towards the end from, what I've, from all the research that I've been doing and from what I understand is that selling advertising was a little bit difficult because you talked about it was it was not just for kids right. but then advertisers are like then who's it for so i know at one point there was a discussion of possibly bringing it into the evening but that had never happened before where they started a, a show in the saturday uh, on a you know early morning and then brought it into like you know the flintstone started on on right. you know in the evening and then moved to saturday morning um, I guess one of the reasons was then there would have to be contract negotiations because you're in the evening, it's going to cost more to get those the same voices. So that probably was one of those things that just kind of fell by the wayside. I expect so. I never heard anything about that. I wasn't involved. I had moved on in writing and, and right. doing other things. But um, the series itself, what I had to assure the fans when I talked at the convention or conventions was 
This is not going to be a kiddie show. This is not going to be a baby show. We are doing Star Trek. And we are able to do Star Trek in some ways a better way because we could have wonderful spaceships. We could have wonderful aliens, wonderful planets. And we still had good stories. Yeah. And that was the, the key, I think. Stories and the characters, of course, who, who were involved brought the audience in. And we did have a good following, even though it was on a, a Saturday morning, if I remember correctly, at 10 o'clock. I think so. In the morning, yeah. yes. Yeah, I found in the listing of everything that was on. In fact, we've, we comprised our, the intro to our show kind of using intros of other cartoons that were on at that time. Yes. So we yes. Kind of stitched together, I think it's Devlin... The Partridge Family, 2200 AD. Oh my goodness. Well. I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> goodness. Uh, the Super Friends, and then, then we go into the Star Trek intro. What you see on ABC Saturday mornings, you'll be talking about all weekend. You'll be talking about Hong Kong Fui, a canine crusader who changes from janitor to crime fighter at the close of a drawer. About the new adventures of Gilligan and his shipwrecked friends. About Devlin. Three kids out on their own together as a motorcycle stunt team. About Korg, 70,000 BC, a family struggling to survive in prehistoric times. And these are the days about a turn of the century family in rural America. Five bright new shows, part of Fun Shine Saturday each week. ABC programs for children. We take our kids seriously. When everybody talks about the animated series, or even Star Trek in general, one of the favorite episodes that's brought up is Yesteryear, and that was your episode. Yes. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about you know, where you started that and kind of uh, bringing the Saylot into it? And, and Well, I had mentioned the Saylot in A Journey to Babel, uh, talking about Spock's childhood and... Uh, uh, you know, his mother saying uh, about the Salot and, and his, uh, Sarek, the very formal ambassador and all of this. And we knew, we found out a little bit more about his parents in Journey to Babel. But I saw the opportunity of going back into Spock's past and showing how he came to be Spock. Because we could do that in the uh, animated because we didn't have to cast well we did cast a younger voice but we didn't have to have the actor you know on screen he, it, Spock could look any way we wanted him to and but he had this lovely voice and he came back as uh, a protector because he knew what had happened and what how Spock had survived that uh, mission into the desert uh, and how Spock came to be Spock how he reconciled his Vulcan side with his human side and pushed down the human side in part to become the Spock that we knew. But still, that human side was always there. And when we told the story of yesteryear, it gave us that base, uh, how Spock was raised, how he was picked on by full Vulcans who, you know, are Earther, Earther, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the young man voicing uh, young Spock did very nicely, I thought. Um, the role of Amanda was voiced by Majel Barrett, and she tried to make her voice sound like Jane Wyatt's voice. And uh, while Jimmy Doohan, at the time of taping on the stage, did voice Sarek, actually, we got to Mark Leonard, who was in New York doing a play, I believe, and he recorded the Sarek lines, and it is Sarek, so it's Mark yep. Leonard's voice, in the actual episode, Jimmy Doohan has said, oh, that was me. Yes, for just to fill in. But really, we did have Mark Leonard voice Sarek. So it sounds correct. Right. And um, it, was, it was a wonderful episode. It was fun to write. It turned out well, I thought. And people react to it for, for many reasons. Going back into Spock's past, seeing how he became the Spock we know, uh, the family situation, and, of course, the Salon. Well, this doesn't make for maybe the best audio podcasting. We'll put this up in the uh, Babel conference. I have a fanzine here from June of 1970. Uh, it's Spockanalia number five, where they have an article uh, called Concerning Saylots, where they, where they did a really detailed analysis of the Saylot. My goodness. They really analyzed the Saylot here. <laughs> wow. Yeah, the, the weight to... Um, 
size and and what kind mm-hmm. of what it, the sketch itself was not quite the same. No, but, no. Uh, there was one in a different. Uh, fanzine that has a sketch that's much closer to what it turned out to look like Mm. on the animated series yes well i wanted it to be kind of bear-like uh so that it had some kind of lovable quality about it and uh i wanted it to be faithful because the sailot wanted to follow spock and did right and of course saved his life um and uh i had made up that reference in Journey to Babel on the original series. And, you know, oh, it's a teddy bear, says <laughs> DeForest Kelly. And then uh, I think it's Spock who says on Vulcan, the teddy bears have six-inch six fangs. And, and we took it from there. Actually, I have a, a picture there on the wall uh, by Alicia Austin uh, about a, a sailot. That's, and, and when people said to me, what does a sailot look like? I I showed them Alicia's picture. Oh, okay. Uh, so it was basically a large teddy bear type with long fangs, but it was a lovable, loving creature. It, yes. It, it, it was not a vicious creature. But when he had to, he sprang to Spock's defense. All right. I think this is actually Alicia Austin's work in here. It might be. <laughs> yes. Yep, there you go. So, yep, that was the. That's all these sketches that you see here. Yes, yes. Um, and she's a friend of Rick Sternbox. So okay. So yeah, I'm hoping to actually. Of mine too. <laughs> so I'm hoping to actually talk with her at some point about okay. when we go to fanzines and good, all that stuff. Good. Good. Um, the the broken fang to me yes, that was just yes. sort of that that a little bit bedraggled but you know really lovable and he just did have that sort of resigned like okay fine I'm going to follow you if you're going to <laughs> to take off on and do this dangerous thing. It's a, it was. Especially as a kid, I think I was about probably five when I saw that. It was a really interesting story because it prepared me from when our cat died. Ah, you know, it was one of those like, yes. okay, this this happens, and mm-hmm. you know, we I think we had to put the cat down because it got attacked by a coyote. Yes. Well, that's one thing uh, that was interesting about this because I said the sailot has to die to make the story point, and uh, NBC was really nervous about this. But I made it very clear that the choice had to be with Spock to say, do you want him to live and suffer or do you want to give him merciful relief? Obviously, young Spock chose, we must let him go. And NBC was braced for an onslaught of incredible objection. We did not get one letter that I ever heard about that objected. It was like, this is the kind thing to do. Yeah. Let him go peacefully, without pain, and that's what you do. <laughs> and I never heard a complaint personally. I never saw one come across my desk. And that was yesterday was an early on episode, so mm-hmm. I, I would have seen it. You would have it. seen it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> never saw a thing. And NBC was amazed that you could take what was essentially a touchy subject and nobody complained. Yeah. It was wonderful. I loved it. What was the NBC's reaction to uh, the magics of Magus Two? Because it went from, I, I, from what I heard, that it was originally supposed to be meeting God in the middle of the galaxy. To they just switched it over to meeting the devil. And you would yeah. think that they would have more problems with that than, than God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was on that. I'm pretty sure it was written by Larry Brody who's a rather well-known writer now, and he also has a, a terrific uh, uh, blog. Uh, let me see, it's tvwriter.com, uh, and where he is now, in essence, a TV writing teacher. But he has a good track record on uh, you know materials that were both for uh, television. I think there's some features in there. And, of course, he's got this running... Uh, blog that comes on every week and he's encouraging new young writers with his uh, his uh, people's pilot uh, uh, contest Uh, there's some money involved and all that's wonderful things Uh, but Larry was very new writer at the time and he came up with this idea and he said you know that's kind of fun let's let's go for it and NBC did have some uh, problems but as I recall it wasn't that bad Larry adjusted, uh, did what was asked of him, and I think it was a very good seri- uh, you know, uh, 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 episode. And um, 
we had some fun with it. We were able to do some things that we might not have been able to do before. Well, I love when they warp the the characters and they're all like, it's like you know, oh, you're just too attached to your corporeal being in your body. <laughs> yeah. right? So that was, yeah, no, I was like, that's interesting because I think today there would have been a different, just because there's a little bit of an overreactive culture at times to things. Possibly, yes. So yes. drawing a pentagram on the floor might not have <laughs> flown as well as it did back then. I don't know. I mean, there haven't been there's stories about witches. Well, that's true. Yeah, and, you've got and, charmed. You know, and, various and, yeah. various uh, series have had witches on, if not the key characters, at least characters in episodes. That's and, true. Uh, I don't know. Supernatural, I, I think little, and, yeah. perhaps a little bit more leeway these days, and perhaps this paved some of the way. Who all for all we know? Yeah, <laughs> that's interesting, huh? Um, if this was going into the second season, but they had the the Saturday morning review preview of all the cartoons that they used to do back then. And it was hosted by Donny Osmond, or not Donny Osmond, uh, Jimmy Osmond. Ah, okay. And so he was doing this whole song and dance like a kind of a carnival barker. And they have all these little funny clips. And then they go to Star Trek. And it's talking about Spock, he's going to die if they don't get this this medicine into him. You've got Kirk citing different uh, Federation and Babel conference, um, uh, you know, edicts and suddenly you know it then jumps back to pink panther and then the adams family <laughs> and it's this weird incongruous sort of like really adult thing that but kids still really loved it yes yes and i remember that the toys at the time too kind of started to take more of a uh, a visual design sense from the cartoon as much as they did from the original series mm. you started to see like the the Mego action figures oh yes. Uh, yes their Klingons look more like the Klingons from the cartoon show and Interesting. not pink though <laughs> <laughs> well we did have a problem with pink uh, because Hal Sutherland a lovely man uh, who was basically the director he was also a partner in, in filmation uh, was colorblind and therefore he saw things essentially in shades of gray or black and white and uh, on Larry Niven's show uh, the uh, slaver weapon. Yeah, the slaver weapon. The the uh, felinoid, eight foot tall, you know, really rugged uh, aliens arrived in a pink ship, and I I really had to apologize to uh, Larry about that because I said, I'm sorry, I didn't see it until it was ready to roll. I mean, you know, it was right. essentially before camera, and I didn't realize that Hal was colorblind and didn't know the difference between pink and gray and because they used a lot of pink in other shows they did right (laughs) i had to apologize i'm sorry i'm really (laughs) sorry about the pink ship i always wondered about that because (laughs) it wasn't in just one show it was like the the triples were pink it was like i wondered why someone just didn't say i know you're colorblind but this is pink yeah and it looks silly can we actually (laughs) just do it the way everyone else sees it yes (laughs) well that is when it's your boss (laughs) you don't approach him uh, speaking of, of the animation process and such, what was it like to actually work in that office? The, I believe it was on Reseda? Uh, yes, in I think Tarzana. Yeah. Uh, well, Filmation was a well-established animation house. And to their credit, they did not do anything out of country. It was all in Tarzana, California. And they had a huge art department and, and uh, people who were, they painted the cells uh, as directed, as people who created the cells. In other words, they did the original artwork. And then, of course, people who had to put it before the cameras to make it come alive. Uh, so it was a, a very large, for a small company, operation. And uh, everybody was really, really talented. I mean, it, it was amazing. But all the work was hand done. The biggest uh, innovation at that time was the fact that you could use a Xerox to take uh, a drawing of static backgrounds, ones you're going to be using in, in a number of frames, mm-hmm. and you could Xerox them black and white onto a cell. And then the painters would go to work and they would paint in the background by hand so the only big thing was you could xerox produce some of those consistent cells so that they could be gotten to the art department faster Uh, that was really the only big innovation everything else was done by hand frame by frame and i think uh, largely for star trek in particular it was very well done beautiful work Uh, but it was a long slow process it took at least if I recall correctly, three months 
to do a 22-minute episode of Star Trek. That was what made it fairly expensive. If I recall correctly, the budget was approximately 40 or 45,000 per episode. Wow. I, I might be underestimating that. Uh, maybe it was more like 60. But this is fairly expensive, but you're talking about three months of hand work, yeah. largely. And, uh, you know, t- for my money, it was really well done. It was well executed. But these people knew what they were doing. They had a number of series on, yep. and, and they were working all the time on all these series. So you had a huge amount of people who were all doing hand work to produce these various series. And the really, I think, intense original kinds of work were done on Star Trek. They were the first people to bring, uh, I think, Superman to to animated. Uh Um, And one of the things that they did to kind of help with that process was create sort of actions for certain, like you'd have the same sort of like the body of somebody running towards the camera. Yes. Or something to that effect. So you could could at least kind of use that as... um, it's something to speed the process along a little bit. Right. A starship passes, things like that. Right. Uh, we got a wonderful planet, but the, but the Enterprise looked the same, which yeah. was wonderful. It was beautifully uh, drawn, too. And they were able to do that fairly quickly. Yeah. Uh, what obviously became more intense work was when you're down on the planet and you're dealing with, or you're on a spaceship, and you're dealing with a situation. Yeah. Aliens within the crew, y- you have to animate all this, and the faces had to look right. Right. Uh, of course, we had the voices. Mm-hmm. Uh, the faces were somewhat limited at that time. You could do more today. But uh, we, we got the messages across. The, the key expressions of key characters were there. Mm-hmm. So at least that was there. And, and people could read the characters and say, oh, yeah, that's, that's Dr. McCoy. Oh, yeah, that's Spock. When you get the, the little tick of the eyebrow yes. or, or just like a, the way Shatner would crinkle his eye a little bit, and it, that actually came across really yes. well. yes. Every once in a while, they do the thing where the person would put their hand up to their mouth, so they just <laughs> didn't have to, you know, animate the lips or. Yes. But yes. Uh, it's funny. Somebody had pointed out that if you watch a live action show, they kind of bounce back and forth. If you're looking at, you know, basic talking heads, and they don't really look dramatically different from scene to scene. So if you're doing it in animation, it would be hard to a- actually make them look different between the two. Anyway. You'd have to constantly be shifting it for no real reason. Uh, maybe the only thing would be like a frown or a, yeah. look, a sideways look right. or some motion of the mouth. Uh, yeah, uh, but on the whole, it was well do- done. It yeah. really was well delivered. And uh, the actual animation, as I said, took at least three months and was somewhat costly. But I think we turned out a good show. Definitely. Um, and... The uh, the writer strike at that time actually really helped add to the quality of that show, which seems uh, counterintuitive. But you were telling me that uh, that that really um, led to some good stories. Yes, um, I believe we went on strike in March, something like that, and it was at least a three month strike, if not somewhat longer. Uh, but the writers that we would have called on for Star Trek the original series were sitting around on their hands, and they could write for animation. You, the rules were then that you could write one script for an animated show and not have to join the Animators Guild. Hmm. And uh, the pay was not much. It was $1,300 for a half-hour script. And, of course, there were no residuals. You don't get residuals on... No, oh, I didn't know uh, Well, at least not then. You okay. didn't get... Um, and a number of our writers uh, that had written for the original show said, sure, I'll do a Star Trek. Why not? And, you know, th- they came aboard. Uh, Margaret Armin, I believe, did two. David Gerald did two. A couple of other people. And some just did one. But we had Samuel A. Peoples and we had Stephen Candell and we had a whole bunch of people uh, who were able to write for the show. And it was okay with our union and the Animators Guild. And... Um, we had some very, very good stories because we were going to people who knew the show. They could write Star Trek. We weren't having to break anybody in here. (laughs) Or there are a few new writers, but mostly, but they knew the show too. Uh, But uh, we worked out a a deal with a number of our original Star Trek writers who said, sure, we'd love to do it. And they came aboard. The only one who didn't, oddly enough, was Gene Kuhn. And Gene said, eh, $1,300? Nah, I don't think so. And I was sorry to lose his voice. Yeah. Uh, because he just felt he didn't want to do it. Uh, but Gene had been such a, a a strong 
element in the original series that it was a shame we couldn't get it into the animated. But uh, other voices were heard, and uh, we had some very, very good episodes, I felt. Well, I w- what was really interesting to me about uh, the first episode that aired, Beyond the Farthest Star, um, is it had a really nice symmetry with the uh, story that Samuel Peoples had written yes. for the live-action show. Right. It was just, there was that going to the edge of the galaxy, and, and apparently, that which is filled with electromagnetic beings that you just do not want to get near. <laughs> yes. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I just, every time I watch them, what I really enjoy, what I appreciate is the conciseness of them as well, because you don't have time to to get a lot of that, well, we're kind of getting lost in this B-plot or something yeah. like that. So it's really tight. And and another thing that I noticed that was nice, that every character seemed to have something to do. Yes. That was, you know, you didn't have, well, at one time, Uhura actually takes over the ship. Yes. And, and rescues everyone else. So... I just found that that was really nice to see that everybody got a chance to shine. Yes, uh, we had a good time writing those scripts because, again, we had people familiar with the series who love the series and uh, were happy to be working on it. So uh, we had good stories going out. We also had almost all of the core of actors. Unfortunately, uh, we could not afford Chekhov's voice. There was just one too many voice. There was nothing against Walter, of course. Um, in fact, uh, Leonard and Nimoy and William Shatner said, uh, wait, you just got the three of us, Bill, Leonard, DeForest Kelly. Uh, we want the others in here too. And that was soon arranged because, in fact, it gave us more storytelling possibilities. Right. So we had uh, Jimmy Doohan, uh, who did a lot of other male voices. We had Majel Barrett uh, as uh, Christine Chapel, but she also did a lot of the female voices. Uh, and then, of course, we had uh, Nichelle Nichols, and we had uh, George Takei. Um, we couldn't fit in Walter, but Walter was trying to start a career then, uh, an offshoot, uh, as a writer. And we said, Walter, come on down and write one. You've been on this show. You know Star Trek. So he did The Infinite Vulcan, and it was his first produced writing credit. Uh, and it was a pretty good show, too, I have to add. Uh, so, you know, he was able to take that and then move on to further writing uh, assignments in other areas. But uh, it was the one way we could say, Walter, we appreciate you. We love you. We can't pay you for this, but let's pay you for that. And he did a wonderful job. Yeah, he uh, he mentioned that he was looking at clippings of the newspaper at the time, and they, everything was talking about cloning and, mm. and genetics yes. was sort of like really new then. And so that's how that sort of dovetailed from with the eugenics wars yes. related. So it was really nice that we had that tie into this to the show, which is interesting because he wasn't actually in the episode with Khan. So he got to have his little you know mention of that. And then, of course, in Star Trek II, Somehow he was so that was he told me a lovely story about how uh that Chekhov was actually just in the bathroom <laughs> <laughs> so he had actually met Khan we just didn't see it okay so yeah that that and, and apparently Ricardo Montalban had said that that was now in his canon but oh, he, he believed that 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 Chekhov really was there so oh, great <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad <laughs> so Chekhov wasn't in the first season of the original series, and you weren't in the second season of the animated series. If for some reason there had been a third season, would you have been interested in coming back and and working on that? Well, I left the show after the first 16 episodes because I did have offers elsewhere that were now in the television business where we were being paid a lot more money, et cetera. (laughs) Uh, You wanted to eat. I, I, I very did enjoy the doing that show simply because it was a new experience and the story possibilities that we had in animation uh even in a 22 minute time zone of telling our stories was uh so invigorating it was it was so inspiring that we could do these stories that in a way pushed us beyond what we were able to do on the original series we tried to keep all the original Uh, relationships and carry those forward and so on so that our characters were as you remembered them and they were also able to grow Uh, but uh, I felt oh I have to move on so the the second six episodes I was not involved with although one of my friends uh, Russell Bates uh, did Oh, uh, that which survives? No. That's not oh, right. how sharper than a serpent's tooth. How sharper than how sharper than a serpent's tooth, and Russell wrote it with uh, a partner, uh, David Wise, 
and they did win the Humanitas Award. It was the only award Star Trek had won ever up to that point. Wow. Uh, so that was wonderful. And uh, I, uh, I, I love Russell. He's, he's a wonderful writer, and he is a Kiowa owl man. He is uh, just a wonderful shaman and uh, still a good friend, still writing good stories. And uh, sometimes I threaten people, don't get smart on me because I know a Kiowa, Kiowa owl man. I'll get you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, but uh, the second six I had nothing to do with. So I, I, you know, I can't take any credit or blame for that. <laughs> but if it had gone to a third season, I think I might have circled back and said, hey, let me get in here again. Because, again, the kinds of stories we were able to tell as Star Trek stories was – expanded simply because of what we could do in animation, uh, what was possible. And for the time, it was very good animation. Now, animation under CGI has gotten better, obviously. Uh, facial expressions, for instance, uh, much more uh, realistic and, and expressionist. Uh, but the possibility of telling stories in that world of animation was really so big. It was very enchanting. So if we had gotten a third season, which I wish we had, but we didn't, uh, I think I would have circled back and said, at least let me write a couple if I wasn't even you know, a story editor. But um, it was really a fun series to do and, and a very good experience with filmation, I have to say. Very good experience with filmation. They seem to be really positive about the whole situation. They, they liked the fact that NBC could leave them alone so they could actually work with the artists and the writers and, yes. and not feel so constrained. And they just seemed like really nice people. The fact that they kept everything in the United States yes. because they wanted the families that worked with them not to lose their jobs. And Absolutely. to you know, and yeah. from, you know, I've read some of uh, uh, Lou Scheimer's backstory and it's like he basically moved out here to take a job that then was just completely canned as soon as he got here so i'm sure he knows that whole like here's a job now you don't have it here it is now you don't you know so it's that feast or famine kind of thing well it, it was a good company to work with uh simply because they were rather form family oriented uh they wanted to tell good stories and i have to say that nbc while they were keeping an eye on us for censorship purposes rarely had any severe or or very big uh, problems with the show. They did have a worry about the, the Salot dying, mm -hmm. uh, but that was handled and they were fine with it. Uh, most of the rest of the time, it was just a matter of uh, showing violence and, and how much you could show. And that was fairly easy to deal with in animation. Was that like those, uh, the plants that were grabbing at, yes. uh, <laughs> at, uh, Young Spock? Yes. Um, but you know, most of the time we didn't have a lot of problem from NBC. They seemed to be very happy. Um, unfortunately they didn't go beyond the uh, 22 that we did do but um, you know I still think that animated series has a lot going for it that was good storytelling and um, interesting storytelling for the time and the fact that we were really doing Star Trek even on an animated series level we didn't make it kitty Star Trek it was Star Trek yeah. that was the rule all the time and our writers understood that and delivered you watch it and you don't get the feeling that you're being talked down to no Mm -mm. And I think that's one of the things as a child that I appreciated because it was, it was the grown up cartoon basically. Mm -hmm. You know, you had that would be followed immediately by, you know, pussy cats in space or just seeing the <laughs> pussy cats in space, um, which is funny because one of the one of the people uh, who is kind of a, a fan of Trek FM, his mother did the vo voice of a Josie one of the one of the pussy cats on oh. there, <laughs> Valerie, I think. Um, so it was just kind of funny. That it's like. And when we started this podcast, we've now gotten a lot of people who had either never heard of this before. They're like, what do you mean there was an animated series? Because they're, you know, in their 20s. Um, and we've really got a lot of people, a resurgence of interest in looking at it. So That's wonderful. So I'm, I'm excited that, you know, we have a, a Blu-ray version coming out soon. Uh, so hopefully that will even put more eyes, you know, on this in mm -hmm. front of people and... When it first came out, of course, it was on tape. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am holding in my hand the uh, DVD... Version. With a beautiful box. It's a lovely box. And uh, with, with some very nice, uh, you know, uh, little folder that lays out all the stories and, and uh, things like this that tells you a little bit about it. And uh, I'm sure the Blu-ray version will be very nice, too. And, again, as uh, educational in terms of what it was uh, and what the stories are. 
Yeah, we don't. We're not sure if they're going to just repackage the original extras that were in that, or if we're going to maybe shoot some new ones. Or so I, I'm anxious to find out about that. Yes, so it would be, be nice. kind of interesting. <laughs> if you were to be presented with the option of doing a new animated Star Trek, would that be something that you would be interested in? And that would be a challenge, I think. Uh, today, the possibilities of how the show would look are so much larger, I think, and better. And again, you have the advantage of being able to create any alien you like, any kind of spaceship, any kind of world. Uh, so that would open possibilities for new stories. Yeah, that would be very interesting. And with the interconnectedness of everything, you could probably bring in some sort of um, interactive component to it, too. I imagine. Possibly. Like, yeah. Possibly, yeah. Be interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So some of the other shows that you worked on in the 1970s, you worked on the Six Million Dollar Man, I did two. Uh, Buck Rogers. I did um, one. <laughs> what was it uh, like working on sort of those other mainstay sort of sci-fi 70s shows? What was, what was the, how different was the writing culture compared to, say, Star Trek or Star Trek the an animated series, which of course was just called Star Trek back then? <laughs> well, uh, it, it was real fun to do the Six Million Dollar Man because I think I did one of the very first really science fiction shows <laughs> in that I was, uh, it was, let me see, The uh, Rescue of Athena One was the first one I did, which starred Farrah Fawcett, who was then married to Lee Majors. I love that episode. And uh, <laughs> it, 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 there was just a suggestion to me. So we want to do this female astronaut. And what kind of story can you tell? I said, well, how about she goes to space because at that point women had not gone to space. Right. So it's the first woman astronaut going into space and she's going alone on a, on a, a single person's spaceship. And, uh, or was she, what did, did she have a, a co-pilot who died? Oh, I, I think on the pad yeah, before it yeah, launched. Yeah, yeah. There was an accident. Anyway, uh, she runs into trouble, has to go to the international space station. And then of course, Lee majors has to come and rescue her. Uh, but, but it was only because there was no way, literally, for her to get down without somebody coming up after her. Right. So, you know, so it wasn't like she was this helpless female. She was helpless for a real reason. Yes. And um, what was really cool was that NASA was so thrilled with this idea, literally, that they let us run barefoot through all their, uh, you, you know, all their uh, space launch, uh, anything we have, the, the 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 spaceships coming down and landing, and you know anything they might have had on on the International Space Station, etc. Was that Skylab at the time? Skylab, yes, and 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 they were so wonderful about it. I wish I could have gotten down there to Houston to take a tour myself, but they did let us use the actual training area here in California that was for for the spaceship pilots and how they you know encountered mm -hmm. problems in space and they it, it was a, it was a run through and so they let us use that it was oh my god this is absolutely wonderful we we're getting so much cooperation and they really liked the story so we got an enormous amount of wonderful looking footage that didn't have to be faked it was real it yeah. was NASA footage and I, th I thought the show came off very well I always liked it. Yeah. The second one I did was, um, it was a turnaround on the aliens are coming here and they're going to kill us and they're dangerous. No, the aliens were here because of an accident and all they were trying to do was get back to their spaceship so they could go home and we were more dangerous to them than they were to us. And the key character of the woman alien was Meg Foster who has those wonderful eyes. She has marvelous eyes. And she carried that off. The whole crew carried it off very well of, oh, they're not dangerous to us. We have to help them get home. And so it was a turnaround of the usual aliens on Earth kind of story. Well, and that was the uh, 1970s that. where they had, it was all the, all the beginnings of that, you know, the the invasion story, yes. you know, like the close encounters and, and the, you know, the gray uh, beans with the big black eyes. And yes. But I, I felt, you know, you can turn that around and have a great story. And apparently yep. it was well received. And I ran into Meg Foster at an art show in Sandy, not, uh, Santa Monica uh, several years later. And I introduced myself and she said, oh, I love doing that show. It was such fun. She, had, she, had, she was very complimentary. Uh, and she was wonderful. She was brilliant. But it, it was fun to do those two because I was writing about women, one alien woman, one woman astronaut, and they were not doing what you might have expected them to do, which I love doing that. I yep. love turning those tables over and saying, hey, how about this? <laughs> yeah, when the 
the person who goes into space doesn't have to be rescued because she's incompetent or something no, like no, that. No. It was like she's it's in real trouble, yeah. like any male would have yeah. had. <laughs> Is this when we first saw Steve have the problem with bionics and in, in low gravity or in zero gravity? Or is it cold? I think it was... I remember there was something to do with space where he was having problems, but I don't remember... It might have been like the later when we saw Farrah Fawcett again. Possibly. I, I, I believe she actually played a different character. That was the strange thing. But that happens sometimes. Um, and later in The Six Million Dollar Man, they ended up using the... They did a an episode at the Kennedy Space Center. Mm. And they went down the emergency chutes that they had for if the Apollo astronauts had to evacuate if there was a fire on the pad. And nobody had seen that before. And it was really interesting to watch it. And they show them go down this giant slide and they and they got to actually do that themselves. So. Yes. I think NASA was really pleased because at the time the program was kind of in abeyance. And any kind of publicity that called yep. attention to NASA and how good they were uh, was very welcome. I think Apollo ended in 75. Mm, I can't remember. Somewhere around that. there. Yeah. But uh, oddly enough, the same people who did Six Million Dollar Man, and let me write those two shows, they were very enthusiastic and very kind to me. Uh, I never got to do a, a bionic woman. That would have been fantastic. <laughs> it was funny. Uh, about a year ago, uh, a neighbor of ours who was in the business, uh, he does Saturday night shows uh, at his home, and he had Lindsay uh, as a guest, and she was talking about doing Bionic Woman, and we ran some a couple of the episodes, the pilot episode and then another one. And I, and I, I was sitting next to her, and I said, you know, I, I did – Two six million dollar man. She knew who I was. Yeah. And I said, I never got a chance to write one for you. And she said, Oh God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, that would have been fantastic. Just another space flight? Not quite. The eyes of the entire world are on this flight, the flight of Athena One, a revived Apollo mission designed to help discover new sources of energy here on Earth. The focus of attention, of course, is on the command module piloted by Major Kelly Wood, the first American woman in space. But the second surprise is the presence of Colonel Steve Austin as flight dynamics officer, in effect, the chief pilot on the ground. And then you also wrote for Land of the Lost, which had a little bit of connection with the animated series because there was Walter Koenig, yes. who wrote the first, I think, Enoch story. The, mm -hmm, the, I think so, and David Gerald, of course. And David Gerald as well. So um, you wrote Elsewhere, I believe? I yes. Think that was the episode? Elsewhen. Elsewhen, sorry. <laughs> and that was when we saw Holly meeting her future self. Is yes. that what it was? Yeah. Yes. I love that episode. Thank you. Uh, it was fun to write. And... Um, it was just a one shot, but I loved doing it because we had fun with the characters. We had a good time with it. And um, I, unfortunately, I don't think the movie did justice to the TV series. No. Uh, but I enjoyed doing the TV series, just even just that one episode. It was fun to work with David on a different level because he was the boss and I was the employee at that <laughs> point. Uh, but we had a good time with it, and uh, I think they enjoyed doing it. And I think it got a good reception. Yeah, I, I think it's one of the more recognize or remembered episodes just because you get that whole glimpse into the future and you figure they probably got home somehow and so yeah that was that yeah and the movie hmm, yeah <laughs> before we wrap up is there any final thoughts that you have about the animated series and maybe about the process or well the process has changed so much uh i mean leaps and bounds because of cgi but i always have a nostalgia for that 1973 series because I know it was all done by hand by people who cared. And that's so much more interesting to me and, and more heartfelt to me than watching even really brilliant CGI done on computers. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's that mechanical element there. Um, and I know it's hard to do on CGI still, because again, you're doing every scene. It has to be rendered. It takes time, and and there has to be an artist behind it doing these images. Absolutely. We look at the difference between Pixar and say some sort of you know lower quality movie, and there's a huge difference because oh, yeah. the Pixar's are storytellers. Yes. And, but yeah. you know, it. it uh, I I have a, a soft spot in my heart for the original animated series simply because. I knew so many of the people who worked there, and they worked hard, and they worked long hours, and it was all done with love and done by hand. So you had artists at work here. Even if it was just people 
painting in the colors, they had to know how to do it. They had to know how to texture and, and shade and all these other things. And you know, so there was real quality artist work being done there, as well as any CGI thing that is being done now, but it's different. Right. It's just a different thing. And you watch the series and you can see that love and that care that yes. was taken because I think it, it I, I do as well. I, if you watch some other cartoon from that era that's done by, you know, maybe like a Hanna-Barbera or something like that, it was a lot more, it felt more churned out. There was something yes. like, you know, even though you had repetitive backgrounds in the animated series, they didn't constantly loop like uh, yeah. Flintstones or something. You had a, a look and feel and maybe you didn't move around as much, but you're also not just looping some sort of, you know, same background set where you're seeing the same building over and over and over yes. again. I think there was real cre creativity uh, in the animated series, not only in the writing, but also in the execution. Uh, even the voices. These people were uh, interested. You know, all our actors, they were interested in doing a good job, having the voice right. And most of the time, we were able to get them together in the same recording studio so they could interact with one another as actors and characters. Uh, occasionally someone would be out of town. I think Bill Shatner went away at least one time one week, and I know uh, Leonard Nimoy uh, was back in New York at least one week or two weeks and had to send his voice recording in. It was done local studio in New York, mm -hmm. and it was sent in. But most of the time, they were in the same studio together, working oh, together. That's good. And, uh, you know, you really got the feeling of the interaction because the actors were there interacting with one another. They, they could react to someone's face or tone of voice or body position and they say oh yeah this is how i have to respond to that and they would put it into the voice that's interesting because a lot of the research that we have been doing shows that they were most of the time not together no they were mostly together so that's great that's that i mean because i always wonder it's like they're really acting off of each other quite well if they're unless they're listening to another tape or something yeah. like that but i don't know that the actors demanded it but we liked it that they yeah. were all there together and could interact with one another as i said once, I believe, Bill was out of town, and I know once Leonard was out of town, and they just recorded it and did the best they could and sent mm -hmm. it in. Uh, but mostly they were there in the same studio, and, well, and I know, it was cool. Uh, what is it? Billy Simpson, who played the voice of young Spock, recorded it all by himself because I guess it was the it was the audition audio, and then they just used it. <laughs> I, I think he was coached by Hal Sutherland on yeah. that because Hal, of course, had the script and knew by that point what we needed to have out of mm -hmm. the young actor and he may have felt that the adult actors in the room might have you know affected his yeah. reaction or how he delivered lines so doing it by himself he could just react to the director mm -hmm. and it was cleaner perhaps yeah you know, only because with so many actors in the room I mean, established actors. Yeah. It might have scared the kid a little bit. Well, and if bit. you're a kid... But, and but he you, did a good job. You, you know what Star Trek is. I mean, <laughs> I, mean yeah. I think he said that he knew that uh, what, you know, who Spock was and everything, but he didn't really... He didn't. He said, "I didn't go back and watch them." Of course, he couldn't go watch, back and watch videotapes. But he didn't. He didn't turn on the TV show and try and figure out, okay, what would a young Spock sound like? He just went in and did his best, and he did a good job. Yeah, it was great. He eventually he grew up to be. Uh, he was a personality on a uh, Doctor Demento, the radio program. Oh, cool. Yeah, it was. He's <laughs> it, whimsical. Will. Yeah. And I was like, that's the same person because I was like, if I found, I found, I was looking for his name on Facebook, and it was like wait, I think these are the same people. And I found, I was like, yeah. Well, so there's all these really interesting connections, what people did afterwards. Um, so is there anything that you're doing nowadays that you want to talk about or anything that, uh, well, anything I, you can share with us? <laughs> um, there are a couple of things I can't talk about. Uh, but uh, one thing is I teach at the American Film Institute. I teach television and film writing to uh, graduate students who are uh, at the AFI for uh, their MFA. And uh, it's, it's been a very rewarding experience for me. I only have a couple classes a week, but uh, these are wonderful, intelligent, talented young people, or they wouldn't be at the American Film Institute. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's always a joy to see them moving on and achieving things, which so, a number of my students have done already. Uh, so that's, that's a joy. Um, I am involved with uh, beginning the novelization of a script I wrote uh, with uh, two partners, and uh, someone suggested to me, you know what, uh, you might novelize this and, and people would be, you know, kind of interested in s if you get it published that, you know, that somebody else has put, spent money on it and now, oh, we might be interested in that. So uh, one of my partners and I are going to be doing the novelization. Um, and 
there is a TV series possibility. It's been it's in presentation form right now. We have been trying to get it around and about. It's uh, just roughly about American uh, American involvement in World War One, but uh, an American who served with the RFC oh. in World War One. And uh, that was not usually done, but he really wanted to get into this fight. And so even though the United States technically was not in it, he was. And uh, so it's a, a very interesting story, and it's a true story. So we're hoping that someone might be interested. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us in the, the Trek FM wood panel den. And thank you so much for sharing your stories about Star Trek, the animated series. And we look forward to uh, anything that might be coming our way that uh, you've been working on. Oh, thank you very much. Let's hope there is. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You know, I still don't believe I actually got to speak with Dorothy DC Fontana, the person that helmed the animated series. But interviewing Trek royalty isn't the only thing we've been doing on Trek FM this week. Here's a taste of some of the things you may have missed elsewhere on the network. Previously on Trek.FM, The Ready Room. The DNA of Star Trek fandom, and I've said it before, fandom existed, fandom enjoyed the show, but the main charge of fandom was to get the damn thing back. To the journey! He tweets out, you know, like, hey, walking around with my mobile emitter, you know, hashtag blessed. You know, it's just, I'm sure that's what he's doing. <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> yep, yep, he's, uh, he's taking photos of his holographic non-dinner. Warp 5. The Romulans had their ship in season four that had the holograms mm -hmm. that made it look yeah. like any other ship. So you could theoretically retcon Minefield into saying they were using that same technology back then. Women at Warp. <laughs> Admiral Alan Alda came to visit Captain Coretta Scott King. <laughs> Meanwhile, morale officer Beyonce is uh, trying to deal with her new Weasley sweater. And <laughs> they're all partying at the first contact party. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. So check out the shows and get in on the daily Trek talk. You'll find them in iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, and the Windows podcast directory for Xbox and Zoom. You can visit our website at trek.fm and view our podcast directory and stream all of our shows right from the website. Saturday Morning Trek is still pretty new on the network, and we'd like to invite you to leave us a ratings and review in iTunes. Not only does it help us know how we're doing, it helps other people find the show. And if you want to find me, I'm pretty much always in the Babel Conference, Trek FM's listener discussion group on Facebook, and more and more I'm on Twitter. My username is GeekFilter, and that's pretty much my username across all social platforms like Instagram and Dribbble. As you know, we've been playing a bit of musical chairs with my co-hosts lately, but I'm happy to announce that Adam Drozen will be stepping in on a regular basis. I wouldn't rule out Darren dropping into the wood panel den from time to time, though. Before we go, I'd like to thank our associate producers Mike Bovia and Eric Extreme. We couldn't do it without you. If you want to become an associate producer of a Trek FM show, all you need to do is become a patron of the network at the $25 or more level. Go to patreon.com slash trekfm and find out how you can become part of the team. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm. Well, I guess I better get the wood panel den ready for our next episode review, The Magics of Megas 2. Where did I put that paint for the pentagram on the floor? Hmm. Oh, and remember, there is an animated series. 